Welcome to another episode of the Prosper Market Maker interview series. I'm your host, Locke Fox, and I'm here with Caleb Aranya from the SCC Lounge chat channel, both in-game and on Slack. Uh, we hear from FCs and alliance leaders and other major meta makers, but we so rarely hear from market makers and industrialists and all the other people who make the economic side of the game work. And that's what the market maker interviews are here for. So once again, let me welcome my guest, Caleb Baranya. Thanks. Very happy to be here. So glad to have you on here. So um, let's go ahead and get, get straight to the meat of it. Uh, just so that, that players who may not have heard your name or may not know you, um, where would they have known you from if they've seen you before or how, uh, what, what is your, what is your thing, your shtick? Well, uh, I've been around for a while, so um, some people might know me from the very early days when I was on the first CSMs. Well, it was actually the second of the proto CSMs. And then I have been part of the Stepstone project and I've, been in Nerf Alliance as a renter in Null, uh, but mostly I hang around in the MD forums, which is really where I live, and the market is really my thing. So um, I formed the lounge in 2009, well, 2008, um, because I thought that we needed something more public and less elitist um, and something more casual. So. That's where most people might know me from now, because that's where I've been hanging for quite a while now. Well, definitely. Excellent. Um, so you said you've been in the game for a very long time. What originally hooked you and what's kept you coming back? Well, originally I was invited by a friend that was part of a, a clan or corporation from Earth and Beyond. Um, and they invited me to join the beta and... Uh, well, I was hooked from day one because one of the first things I did, because I'm very much into uh, things like civilization and, and trading related games. When I opened the screen uh, for markets, um, my brain was a little bit uh, ecstatic. <laughs> I was very much mind blown because suddenly you had a proper exchange where you had both buy and sell and where you had time ranges and volumes and proper price finding and stuff like that. And I was hooked from day one. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, the uh, the market and trade side has always been my particular favorite, and I know there's a ton of people who who um, there's just nowhere else to go if you want if you like that kind of gameplay, which is both exciting and sad. Well, it's it's fun, and I've been talking about this with many people for the last ten years. When people say that other games have similar things and sandboxy elements like Eve. I keep coming back to, yeah, that's true, but none of them has copied the proper market. None of them. There's no other game that has a proper exchange with buys and sells and, and, and proper graphs and all these things from real life. None of them have it. Uh, you can get slightly close in a few, but it's not the same thing. It's not PvP. Well, and also to, to drill the point home, I find that... Um for for its faults eve also gets around one of the other tenets of of mmos where you have that power creep and at, since everything's based on that whole max level thing um you basically rewrite the market on major patch day and though we see swings and swings and stuff in the eve market we tend to only we tend to see them more realistically like if uh it, where where a government agency might say, oh well, we are uh, taxing, we're we're putting a big tariff on this industry, and you'd see a similar move in a in a real life market instead of like, well, everything in this subcategory is completely worthless because we said so. Like we we see a far more uh, fair and cyclical behavior. Yeah, the the, the dynamic is is almost totally player driven there are a few things that are still problematic if you might say so but uh, and then that gets us into the whole thing with sinks and faucets and and inflation and, and creep but generally the balance is really good in eve and and the whole pvp element works perfectly from a market perspective so speaking of market pvp um 
this is my favorite question to ask all of our guests is, do you remember how you earned your first billion esque? <laughs> I, I had planned a small joke because that, that's such a funny question because I've been around for now, well, it's coming up on 13 years. I don't really remember um, when I made my first billion because money was different back then. It's not that long ago that a Plex went from 300 million to a billion and one. Uh, so I think I must have hit my first billion in trading when I must have been 2005 ish uh, when I was uh, when I was doing corporate level stuff. Uh, so so really, it's it's a funny question. Well, I mean, or are there any other big projects from before a billion was our market was our was our yardstick? Something like afforded the first major battleship or uh, whatever the the equivalent needed the. Yeah, the equivalent commodity uh, through time. Well, when I suddenly reached the point when um, money in the wallet was not a problem because we were running the Stepstone project, that was a big uh, moment for me because I didn't really care much of uh, how much I actually put up for orders. I was basically uh, not controlling, but I was highly influencing uh, five, six regions of space because we had to source all the materials for our T2 production. Uh, so that was a big hurdle. Uh, what was that? 2005, I think. So you've, this is the second time you mentioned the Stepstone project, and and uh, that most of, I I'm not familiar with it, and my my listeners may not be either. Can you describe what the what you guys were doing in that project? How it went? Uh, start to end, sort of sort of ideal. Well, when T2 was uh, initially introduced, uh, you had to grind uh, research agents, and then it was kind of like a lottery. Uh, so everyone was on kind of even footing. Um, so a lot of entities, a lot of people, uh, smaller corps and stuff, ended up with T2 prints that they had a lot of problems uh, producing from because it was hard to source the material and it was uh, liquidity heavy and stuff like that. So what we did, um, we used to work in uh, uh, the whole uh, secondary market when meta items could not be traded uh, on the SCC yet. Uh, so we had some contacts and some outlets running with uh, Naga and stuff like that. So what we did was we joined with Naga and we formed the Stepstone project. So these small entities with blueprints could hand in the blueprints and we would then produce their uh, products and give them their profit basically. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So it was a consolidation of uh, smaller entities. And did that come to a head when Invention came through, or did you guys manage to keep the thing running in spite of Invention? Well, it kind of died when Invention came in, of course. Uh, then we didn't have the same control levels as we had before, so people closed down and got their blueprints back and all that stuff. Well, some of them were lost, but that's a different story. <laughs> well, yeah, it. but that's sort of the, the history. I actually, I love hearing the... the what is now maybe ancient history, but definitely drove a lot of the current ways we talk and think about uh, game design in in the current eve. Yeah, it, it was so much trial and error back then, uh, and 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 it was when many of the things that we today call features were discovered by by players. So uh, it, it was uh, it was chaotic. <laughs> Let's just say it like that. So um, this sort of ties into my next question. Uh, your favorite in-game project you worked on? I don't know if that 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 uh, Stepstone project was was your personal favorite, or if there's another one you'd want to talk about. Well, I must say that I've always been mostly interested in the meta game and and what goes on behind the scenes. So yes, the Stepstone project was uh, was very interesting, but uh, I, I I do like my pet project with the lounge more because that was more. Uh, directly social uh, and the lounge was basically to improve services and, and 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 contact opportunity with the md forum that had started to be serious about what would be called meta markets yeah it's definitely an opportunity to to rub elbows with with uh people who know or people who are trying to figure out uh new metas that may not exist yet because that's a lot of where the money is is not just in doing what everybody else is doing but learning how to either do what people are doing much better or to find something that nobody's doing and really make a killing at it 
Yeah, and, and there's still so many holes and so many things that people could actually be doing that it still bothers me a little bit that people haven't actually jumped into it and tried to make a business of it. I was very happy when uh, Red Frog um, and Push started going heavily into uh, a professional uh, courier service. But now that's about ancient history. But it was a really cool thing to see for from a market perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it enables new new levels across the board. So I, I, I do... I do love that despite the age of the game, we can still talk about um, how much more innovation there still is left to do. And, and for a lot of the younger pilots in the, who, who may be listening to this, it's a great opportunity to remember that um, there's sort of two forces at work at the moment in the current metagame where one, there's still a lot more that can be done if you're willing to do the work um, to not just retread things things that make other people money but to invent new systems but also that um with the gerontocracy which is my personal favorite way to describe the the player base around here um there is a lot of the top end that has been leaving and it leaves a lot more room for the middle and low people to work their way up, to find their place in the world, and and to not just uh, throw up their hands in the well, I'm just going to get crushed by goons or whatever. When we're looking out there and we're saying, well, they may not be as strong as they have been in the past, and it's just that we need to get another group motivated to actually do the content. Like if you were really willing to fight, you could go do it. So um, I, I do like reminding reminding the the whole audience frame from young to old that there's still stuff to do. Indeed. And and that brings on two sticks of mine, which is the first one is that CCP has not been very good at giving tools for new emergent gameplay. And they've not been very supportive to niches of the game, even though those niches might actually be extremely important for the general well-being of the game. Uh, the markets is, of course, one of them, and also industry until recently had not seen any improvement for a long time. But it's also the fact that players seem to be very afraid of competition. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, Push and Red Frog, but there's still plenty of room for competition. But to do competition, you need to go in and analyze what is already there and then go in and, and, and offer a better service. Absolutely. And that, uh, especially with Push and Red Frog, knowing how much they comprise the market share, have been rising rising prices for the last two years. And this gives a great opportunity to be the budget thing where, in, in their specific case, and you, you wanted to get a group of your own freighters together, and there are things like non non-major hub-to-hub Shipping is still slow and hard to do, and frankly, I don't think it's worth the price that uh, push that that uh, Red Frog is currently charging. Um, and there are opportunities to do still a ton of opportunity in low sec uh, jump freight for how much Black Frog charges for their freight. Um, there there are still huge holes left in the in in even just that picture that could be exploited if you're willing to build up the the uh the infrastructure and the the group to do it the, but it's also um relating uh, relating to the ccp thing and the fact that a lot of things in, in in game at the moment is actually offered by npc services and i've written a few times about how i call it almost borderline communistic because uh the npc prices you can't compete with there is no way for players to offer similar services and there's not tools for players to offer similar services. So even though it's been tried now three times, no insurance on a player level has been offered because you can't compete with the NPC one. Uh, same with things like financial uh, uh, constructs like banks and stuff. It's very hard to do anything when the tools are not there or there is a clear competition with NPC services, which is why Citadels is going to be potentially such a huge game changer because now you will have actual alternatives to NPC. So now it's just a matter of 
CCP nerfing NPC services totally out of existence. So players will have a proper PvP market for all manner of things. Well, and, and at least for the last few years, it sure seems like from CCP's side, um, ever since EO took over uh, and, and his whole his whole drive was to move as much as completely possible into the player space. Now, um, you mentioned banking and loans, and, and we could say we could take an entire hour to argue about uh, credit in EVE and how the heck players would actually run it so that it it had the transparency and, and stuff to actually run. And I don't as much as interesting as that would be, we'll have to save it for another talk. But it does still point out that there is a drive to enable where it's possible. And and for the things that are still provided by NPCs, um, that 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 space is getting smaller and has bullseyes on it almost everywhere, except for maybe skill books and um, blueprints. Yeah, exactly. But even those, I I have a hope that. Uh... Interesting enough, in, in early history, that there were huge problems with uh, industry facilities and uh, offices and things like that, availability of it, uh, because it was basically too cheap. So people would just plug all the slots. Um, but when they brought in the new change to things like office rental, uh, so it actually moves at a certain speed, then you suddenly always have like one, two, three offices available in data. And this is the dynamic that they need to bring in on all levels of NPC services. Then you will see that players will actually start renting from other players instead or moving to other NPC stations. So the mechanics are there now to actually get this proper free competitive market. Most definitely, yeah. Um, so with that, I, I do want to kind of move into our uh, more specific interview stuff because we could talk we could talk game design for hours and hours and as interesting as that might be and uh feel free to comment on the uh feel feel free to leave comments uh if you guys want to hear more about that uh we can we can do another round uh of, of talking in the future banking and scams <laughs> yeah uh, like <laughs> again leave comments um so I want to get I want to get on to your specific your specific stuff, and I, I kind of want to talk about uh, the SCC Lounge. Um, what has its purpose been in the past, and what purpose are you looking to have it serve now? Uh, from both a veteran and a newbie sort of uh, space, and and uh, what can what can players who who may this this may be their first time hearing about it uh, expect from dropping by and and coming to meet with your with you guys. Well, it's basically just a market newbie-friendly zone where a lot of uh, older players are hanging out that share information about markets and how to invest. And uh, but it's a very casual uh, mood in there. So so basically, drop by and if you have anything that's market MD related, loans, how to start investing, how to start getting into trade, things like that. Anything that's got to do with with that type of method, it it's open and that's what it's for. Sometimes I must admit that we are very sidetracked and talk about everything but market. But every anyone that's new and just put up your hand and say, help, I'm new to this and I would like to get into it. Then someone is going to give you some good answers or tell you where to go. And I've actually opened a second channel specifically for uh, helping uh, new traders, uh, the uh, the GMBA, which is the Galactic Master Business Academy, which is supposed to be uh, basically training from no information, no knowledge, and all the way up to proper day trader. Excellent. Yeah, I, I know that a lot of a lot of the listeners and viewers of the show um, tend to get a little intimidated, especially since I, I know that the particular Prosper show is graph heavy and already talking to people who oriented towards people who already may know what I'm trying to talk about. Um, and it's always great to see another another uh, resource out there for some of the other building blocks up to that point because it can be extremely uh, it can be extremely daunting from a from a starting point to look at there's 10,000 items worth trading and there's 
15 market there's 15 regions or something to go through and oh do i do i ship or do i do i station trade do i arbitrage do i contract market like there are just so many options out there and getting to talk with some of the experts in those fields can be a huge a huge help to sort of narrow it down and understand how to try it well and not just fall flat on your face when you try it without knowing anything and basically if you're shy i would suggest dropping by Slack instead and maybe pulling someone in private. Uh, it's easier because uh, it's not depending on the client. So that's why I'm very happy that we now have that alternative too. Uh, I used to have a, a mirror on an IRC channel, but that hardly got populated. Um, but this is definitely uh, a place where people could go if they want more information and are a little bit shy. Speaking of the the market channel, one of the things that I think a lot of the newer traders uh, may not understand is that there are entire networks of corner markets that are run through mailing lists and channels in game. So, uh, last the last different interview we had up, we had a, a drug manufacturer. And though we didn't mention it on the show, a lot of that trade goes through wholesale channels and wholesale. Uh, uh, through wholesale back channels, both in mailing lists and, and chat channels. Um, furthermore, there's even more when you bring in the Evo forums and talk about uh, direct loans and, and more complicated financial products where people who may have a ton of money are just looking to park it into large projects uh, with guaranteed returns kind of thing, uh, basically a peer to peer banking. So could you talk at all to, to any of those or all of those, uh, and, and your experience with them? Well, when it comes to my field, I, I think it's still only the MD forum where most of that takes place. And we have had, uh, some attempts of starting, uh, services like, uh, the BSAC, uh, stock exchange. Uh, where people actually try to build a proper uh, player-driven uh, shares-based uh, stock exchange. That's closed now, and same with the banks and stuff like that. But you can still get some proper uh, IPOs, loans, bonds uh, through the MD. Uh, but it does actually take a little bit of, uh, of research. You have to have the collateral or a good business plan or stuff like that. Some of it is still scammy, semi uh you have to be serious about it and you have to prove that you're serious. Uh, if you want to get some loans or if you want to invest, you have to be very careful what you invest in. So it's basically, you have to do some research because we don't have the tools yet and we don't have really good outlets in, in that market. Um, we were promised to get things like uh, storefronts and stuff like that to present our markets, but that never happened. Um, and the Eve Gate prop, uh, project kind of fell on its face too. So you have to do a lot of work yourself usually. Yeah, and and I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying it's the easy way, but uh there are there are a lot of there are a lot of bulk trade channels where building relationships can be more profitable than just trying to scam your way to the top kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's why you 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 can shop around in different channels and of course there's the uh, pre-made ones with uh, trading and, and blueprints and industry and stuff like that where you can usually go and then get some connections because very serious people in those fields will still be hanging around even in the in-game created ones um, so it's a bit well it's, it's what we call the, the the shadow market right all the stuff that never gets visible in-game um, and the size of it and who runs it you had the example with the drugs um, I think if people like that were a little bit more serious and made some outlets, like made a website and promoted that website and indicated with other websites so they could do advertising and stuff like that, then they would be easier to notice, right? Uh, I find it a little bit funny that if you go to something like Red Frog, it's still not very hard on the promotional side and the advertising side, even though it's such a huge business. So. That would be my answer to that. It's still very hard to find. You have to do a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, if we can change gears for a minute, um, one of the one of the 
things since we've been talking about both co- modern modern history and and more ancient eve history um we see that current events are covered ex- rather well uh uh, in the current meta. So we have Crossing Zebras for a lot of editorial content. We have Eve, Eve News 24 and TMC as news outlets. And we're starting to actually see economic reporting thanks to Prosper and Eve Talk. Since, since we have this coverage, uh, there aren't a whole lot of missed events and it's easy to, uh, Google your way back through history. Are there, um, other scams or events or, uh, other things that may have been lost in the deluge that were your personal favorites um, that that deserve more coverage or a deeper dive into into history to to go into. Well, it's always fun when when something happens uh, that's not been seen before, and when you see things like the first Ponzi schemes and the first big ones like uh, the D Bank and and E Bank scams, they were very fun to 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 be well observing from the sideline and some of them were even uh, happening just around the same time that I was starting at the lounge and when the MD was getting very serious. Um, so something like tips for you, the, uh, the Titan scam, I found very entertaining. Um, many scams in EVE seem to be not planned as scams, but it is actually an excuse for burnout. Um, and things like uh, Titans for you, I think it's very much bordering on a burnout scam. Um, so, so, but that was fun. And, and then I personally liked the game mechanics related ones where you could do the insurance scam back in the day, uh, where you were basically blowing up hundreds of, uh, battleships with platinum insurance for profit. <laughs> I think that's fun. <laughs> so th- I think that's some of my favorites. Well, only the, the the only downside there was basically subsidizing uh, ganking, which was kind of pissing me off at the time. <laughs> but it was fun. It was it was very fun to see someone actually buying that many battleships and then just blowing them up. Very grotesque. Almost as fun as when they then changed the building cost, and everyone was trying to get in on it and cornering that market, and then was like totally overstocking on it. And I think it took what. Six months or something like that, at least. Oh, it took over a year to get the battleship, uh, the battleship changes to wash through. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know people who are sitting on just stacks and stacks of those things. And then we get into the whole thing with CCP sometimes not thinking about balance, right? Because recently they did the whole thing with um, making the T1 hulls useful again, right? So, so now they're useful again as a raw material in creating the Tech 2 version. But they forgot to then remove them from the newbie stuff. So we are still getting totally oversupplied with tech two, uh, tech one holes that should go into a tech two hull. Yeah. So, um, I, I, we're going to, we're going to, de- we're going to deviate from the, from the notes here because it actually touches on a piece of meta that I think is actually worth discussing. Um, when CCP Quant put together his, uh, his, monthly report uh last uh last november um the big piece i was not expecting to see and was actually surprising to me was the actual isk faucets and sinks and the isk velocity in the system and that i found it interesting from sort of a armchair developer standpoint of as much as we complain, yes, it does seem that there are that the faucets are too high and the sinks are too low. Um, but on the other hand, any any move that just like just like the Fed in real life, any move that CCP does is going to be metagamed and uh, exploited to to the nth degree, and it might take three or four years for a specific change to actually land the intended consequence. So the question around all of this is how do we adjust the, the ISK faucet sink uh, ratio without completely, without making it a, a chance for everybody who has a trillion ISK to just have now two trillion ISK <laughs> as a giant metagame. Well, that brings on the whole irony of uh, what CCP is. All right. The abbreviation is actually crowd, con- crowd control production, but they don't seem to be very good at actually doing crowd control. Because 
they don't seem to want to be too harsh on how they implement their design and their balancing of design. Uh, things like the rental thing that I mentioned, it took years for them to realize that it was actually too slow and it needed to be a lot harsher to actually trip change player behavior. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it brings on the whole thing about depletion and diminishing returns. They need to not be that scared of it from a game perspective because the EVE universe is very big. So there is not as much of a problem with depletion as they may think. Letting something like uh, asteroid belts deplete or respawn slower, uh, diminishing returns on pounding on agents, on ratting in carriers, stuff like that, bounties, anything related to a faucet needs to be depletable. Otherwise, the players have way too easy a time just gaming it and milking it totally to the to the hill. Well, and I mean, it kind of touches one of the things I've been I've been a little critical on my show about was that it was interesting to see CCP Fozzie come in last spring uh, during FanFest and say uh, high end materials are just not worth it, and we really need to make sure we really need to have the goal of this uh, this line for isk per meter cubed of of materials is that you got to a point where like abc isk per hour was somewhere in the same uh vein as low end isk per hour just because you could mine so much of the abc in wormhole and nullsec that it was becoming functionally worthless and it was interesting to see what he changed and then if you look at the year's worth of graphs how little it actually sticks is that even though high ends have been moved up the the people are still mining the best thing that they can get their hands on and they're still providing as much as they possibly can and without an industrial machine to absorb it to on the demand side to actually make the ships and get them exploded and do the activity to to wash those minerals from faucet to sink um yeah, but it brings on the whole thing that, that you talked about, right? One of the data points that is actually needed for all this, instead of listening to individual players or play styles, what we need is data. We need things like ISK per hour. We need ISK, uh, the, the measurement of how fast money runs into certain areas, how fast raw materials runs into certain systems. These are the type of things that Quant would be able to pull, and, and, and then we could actually act on data instead of personal feelings and what someone is saying to Fozzy or what Fozzy has noticed uh, is a problem because it might not have been. Well, and, and yeah, so I mean, I, I 100 percent agree that data is is required to make good decisions. And I think over the last couple of years, uh, CCP has been using it more and more to their benefit, um, especially with Quant's uh, openness to to get to get out to the player base. I think that we're seeing a far a far healthier development cycle but even with that data you still need you you still need to be able to do a lot more than just look at the chart and tell me like like i'm pretty sure that that the the mineral change was actually discussed and actually had data behind it and and that the doubling effect that they asked about that they actually ended up putting in had some merit on a first order effect except that Perhaps the the piece of data that may not have been pulled is the actual sinks and where um, a projection of PVP output, uh, PVP uh, destruction may not have been either may not have have lived up to the projection or uh, may not have even been pulled in the first place. I, I don't want to like like completely throw anybody under the bus that on on speculation, but there are second and third order effects that may not have been discussed because we were thinking only in ISK and ISK faucets and sinks and not thinking about mineral faucet and sinks or moon goo faucets and sinks because each of those materials is generated in a similar form to ISK but may not be uh, may not be getting balanced in the same way. Yeah, but I think mostly the problem was that the whole argument was from uh, an internalization point of view. Uh, basically breaking interdependence 
right? Basically saying that we want to be able to do our thing out here in null ourselves without being dependent on say high sec or low sec or wormholes. And and this from a design perspective, I think is a flaw that, that, that every time people hit a bottleneck or a strain, something that, that they cannot do themselves, then their solution is to get CCP to change it so they can do it themselves. Uh, a good example of this is what brought around Red Frog and, and Push, right? Logistics is a big strain. It's very, very hard to do all of it yourself. So it has to be outsourced. You have to do, uh, you have to use someone else if you are on the scale where you opportunity cost can't do it yourself. And, and we need more of that, not less. We need more interdependence. We need more lateral integration. So people that specialize actually get the benefits and the profits from specializing. Well, and I, I think that uh, the designers have been pretty good about tempering the the idea the the rugged individualist cry because it's always been that that that's been the call in every single MMO is I want to do it all myself and I want to do it for free because I don't value my time like that's that's going to be the the siren call forever and ever every MMO ever made. And I think they've done a decent job tempering it because uh, with the with the change the, the the rest of the changes to the mineral equation, specifically bringing more low ends to the the null sec frontier, I don't think is inherently evil because you are you are saying you could you could then say that we've we've lowered that bar on the freight on on the total freight needed to move around, and that that will encourage a different kind of play style because we've moved, we've, we've ex uh, lowered the bandwidth on one choke point without just giving you a free lunch. And I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm not against the metas changing and evolving over time. What I am against is this sort of uh, myopic ideal that one, all I need is one thing and somehow that will be the magic bullet or I need, I need my play style to be subsidized and be made more uh, valuable than some other play style, which this being CSM season, we're going to hear a lot of. Most likely. Uh, the, the point I, I was trying to make is, is that they changed the uh, ability to compress uh, low end quite a lot, right? So they helped on the logistics side and then they also gave more low end minerals to null. That means that you are breaking the dependency between the interdependency between null and high tech. Well, on on the smaller end, you're still having the I, I'm not entirely against it in that uh if you're going to supply battleship and battle cruiser metas, um your local production without the insane pre creus uh per, uh compression uh, makes makes a bit more sense to to you know value where you live and and perhaps get more out of uh, the people that you work with and I'm not entirely against that I am a little bit against the whole like uh, high sec is where where we should see a truckload of trick coming from and I and that I feel that um, having the null sec supply uh, subsidizes some of the value of high sec miners uh, so that we're seeing both more mining in low sec and more mining in high sec and I don't exactly believe that that's the best place to put player hours but that's not my call to make no no i'm just i'm just saying that that with better data and figuring out you don't know if if uh uh in say npc null people are behaving in a different way and generating different things into the game whether it's mining or whether it's uh mission running or ratting the point is that if if you don't allow the differences from a design perspective then you don't make space interesting to have uh interrelations import exports balance of payment things like that because giving every system the same or letting all of null just make their own stuff then what's next should we just get low sec uh, or and an null uh, minerals in high sec so they can do all their things themselves too. You need the, the the difference in space. Otherwise, you don't create the emergent gameplay. Um. So to just transition from from one metagame speculation to a brand new metagame speculation, 
um, citadels are coming up, and I know a lot of people are really excited or tentatively nervous about them. Um, what are you doing to prepare for citadels? What are you hoping that this brings to the both the market side of the game and your own per personal playstyle, perhaps? How are you? How are you uh, preparing for your for citadels to to hit? Well. Basically, I'm doing two things. I'm, of course, getting heavily into the whole speculation, which is expected. So I'm investing in, in all the related uh, items that's going to go into producing the citadels. Uh, but I'm also uh, training hard on my accounts uh, to get uh, more trade skills so I can actually plant some uh, characters in the citadels if they start being competitive compared to NPC uh, stations. So that's mainly what I'm doing. And I'm really hoping that there's going to be enough motivation and incentive for industrialists to rent with other entities that got large or even medium uh, citadels. So we get things spread out more, get more dynamic, more price differences, more markets for everyone to take advantage of and more difference. I would like to see uh, a lot more movement and dynamic in the market. Right now, we still have this horrible hub centric for location, everything and everything else is dead. Um, so I hope Citadels could help and change that. Are you expecting to own a Citadel yourself? And uh, if I, if it's not OPSEC, <laughs> you're going to go any ideas on where you're going to drop it? Uh, well, I am planning on, on, on getting a Citadel, a, a large most likely, but uh, I'm waiting till all the whole hype has eased down and people have padded their kill mails with Citadels and stuff like that. So I'm holding back a little bit and uh, uh, where I would place it, well, for historical reasons, I could actually be inclined to put it into uh, Yule. Um, so I could start a small trading hub back in the old trading hub. So that would be my choice, I think. That would be, that'd be great to see. I, I know we've been joking on the hydrostatic side to, uh, to gather up a bunch of money and go put it in Erin Usta so we can watch the Children of Light and dedicate it to uh, web spaceships. I hope there's going to be a lot of RP around the Citadels because that would be epic. Definitely. So the, the, other, the other kind of question in the longer term is since Citadels are supposed to be the next big uh, milestone on our run towards players run everything uh, dream that Seagull has, has been showing off for the last year or two years. Um, what are your hopes in the other promised structures? Um, personally, I'm looking forward to the, the shakeup that we may be able to see from the extractors, especially now the brain in a box is out and we can talk more about, uh, more complicated, less linear systems that, that those may get tied into? Well, one of the things that I'm hoping for with Citadels, and especially with uh, with soft changes and soft balancing and stuff like that, is to see more um, reasonable and logical warfare. Uh, because as a, as a market person and an industrialist, I'm very much into actually being able to follow what is going on with wars and who is losing what. Um, but up until now, we've not really had proper logical war. It's been mostly uh, PvP centric or, uh, or almost like uh, briefing, really, or who is hating who. It's not, I need this space. Uh, I, I jokingly uh, call this uh, Lebensraum. Uh, I think if we get Lebensraum-based warfare, um, we will see some very, very interesting developments in EVE. And I think that's on the table. And I think that's where they're going with the new trick changes and the whole pipeline. It would be interesting to actually break the uh, the back of the West and South is basically the only piece of null that's really worth fighting over. And holding it has never re hasn't been hasn't really meant much since the Fountain War because it, it just seems that either one side can act unilaterally or um, if they extend themselves too far, it, it just becomes a pet battle. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm with you in, in hoping that we see better motivations for conflict uh, because conflict means 
more more products are getting bought and destroyed and consumed and and used and i like war 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 means i make a lot of money but also if if i'm not mistaken what you might actually see uh, and i think even goons talked about this uh if you get people into null right then it's actually the people that's going to be the value in null it's not the system instead of putting up uh, awesome materials they are not as relevant as the people that are using it so if you got a even a small group this could be five or ten people in a system and they are specialized in say drug production now that system is valuable this is the value we'll have to i i'm i'm hoping i'm hoping with you uh, the same that that we see more more drive towards specialization more drive towards investment in that infrastructure and uh reasons to both defend and attack it would be would be also excellent and i think that especially with the brain in the box changes that the ability to make that far more interesting really is on the table now i mentioned drug right uh the, the drugs if there's an entity that is specializing in one system they will need other supportive specialization they will need logistics they will uh, need tool production for what they're actually doing. They won't be able to do all of it themselves. This is why I want to get away from the insular and the internalization uh, design, because that hinders specialization. And it looks like that's what they're doing. With with that also, it's, it's CSM season, as we mentioned at the top of the show. And um, there's going to be a lot of people talking about talking about their plans for the eve economy and um i know i will be rolling my eyes at a lot of them so i i was hoping that that maybe you had some words uh, of advice towards candidates who might consider themselves economic candidates or things that you will be looking for as thumbs up thumbs down kind of kind of things in the csm 11 race or uh other things that might be benefits or boondoggles for for candidates in the current season well as always I'm looking for realism and any candidate that talks about things like markets or economy or how things are balanced, if they're using real life examples, that's where I'm looking. And it's the same when, when we talk about things like, like markets and creating businesses and starting corps and stuff like that, the more you use the real world as your model, the more likely it is that it's going to be good. That's why anyone that wants to do something good for the CSM and the meta game, get into meta. When you build your corporation, you have to think of it as if it's a real corporation. Make your website, make your business plan, do your spreadsheets, all of these things. It might seem boring, but it can actually be simple enough so you can get started. You don't need an MBA to start it. You just need to try. I point to... Uh, uh, noir as the best example of explaining how you start a corporation and and that's how you get into the whole meta and how you improve the game for everyone because then it will become emergent are there any candidates that are either on your radar for endorsement or uh that may that you may be watching closely to see if they're going to screw something up well because i like people that are objective and very neutral uh i'm a big fan of steve renukin um but i'm keeping my eyes open for other candidates. But that's basically what uh, I'm looking at at the moment, because he is very open to listen to anyone that's got uh, ideas or comments, uh, regardless of what branch of Eve it's about. Definitely. Uh, praise Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, the, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting season for sure. Always. Election season, always interesting. So uh, with that, uh, we're coming to the end here. Are there any other things you'd like to pimp or talk about? Um, any any way that people should get in touch with you if they want to know more? Um, any other projects you'd like to talk about before we before we close this up? Well, I will just say drop by the lounge, say hi. If there's anything that you need or want, don't be afraid to ask. And uh, keep your eyes open. I am building a new website for the lounge and it would be it should be launching very soon. And then I have a second project that I won't disclose too much about yet. Ooh, secrets. Exactly. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. It was great talking with you. Um, I'm hoping that we get another chance to have you on the air uh, for a future project that, again, I want to keep 
kind of on the hush hush until we can actually lock everything in. Um, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks again for, uh, for illuminating some of the more traditional market aspects for our listeners. Thank you, Lockhart. It was awesome.